So in this video, I'm going to talk about chapter 27, which is nuclear physics. And I'm, I'm talking about the first subtopic, which is mass, excess, and nuclear binding energy. So um, this is basically, we're going to discuss Einstein's most famous equation, which is E equals mc squared. And um, this is probably one of the most quoted and well-known equations in physics, but it's very rarely understood for what it actually means. So what does it mean? And basically, Einstein found out there's an equivalent, there's a direct correlation between mass and energy. So if we were to say get a 1 kg mass here and we vaporize that completely into energy, we completely transform it into energy, and this is what Einstein found, you can transform mass into energy and energy can be transformed into mass. So we took 1 kg of energy, I'm oh, sorry, 1 kg of mass and we transformed it into energy, we would get uh, 1 times the speed of light squared which is 9 times 10 to the power of 16 joules and that's a lot of energy for 1 kg of mass. And this is what you've... That, that's why they say this is the future. This is basically dealing with um, atomic fusion, atomic fission. So a lot of people might understand this as, okay, cool. So if I get, uh, say, 1 kg of petrol and I go ahead and burn that, does that mean I will get 9 times 10 to the power 16 joules? Well, it does not. This is um, several thousand times more effective than this, and I'll show you why. Because when we burn petrol, we're essentially doing a chemical reaction where we're changing chemical potential energies. So we're basically what we're doing is we're doing something along the lines of this. We'll have our petrol here and um, we'll basically undergo a chemical reaction and it'll turn into carbon dioxide and water. Um, so you might be like, okay, that's great, fantastic. But what we're, only, what we're actually doing here is we're just changing the chemical potential energies of these atoms. If you notice, there's actually a complete conservation of um, mass here. No mass has changed here. What we're talking about, um, it's just the bonds of atoms have kind of shifted around and changed their potential energies. And that's just kind of resulted in a change of energy for the whole matter, which releases energy that we want. When we're talking about the E equals mc squared, we're talking about doing something like taking a carbon atom and turning it into nothing. And that's the energy we're releasing. It's much, much more energy. We're actually releasing the energy of the mass of the particles rather than the energy of bonding. But what we found is this kind of thing here, where we just take a mass and we just transform it straight into energy, is impossible. This this energy conversion only happens during um, this energy conversion only happens during atomic uh, interactions, and I'm going to show you why. So the first thing we need to kind of appreciate is that. Um, atomic things at atomic levels, you need a different system of units than things that we see at Newtonian levels. So normally we might talk about kg in terms of mass, but because we're talking about individual protons and neutrons, we use something called the atomic mass unit, which is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the power of negative 27 kgs. Very very small. And because um, we normally talk about joules, again we change that into electron volts. An electro um, sorry, I should define this. Uh, atomic mass unit, atomic mass unit is defined as one twelfth of the mass of a carbon twelve atom, and we do that because carbon twelve is a very very stable, very predictable atom, so it's a very good basis for measurement. And one electron volt is the energy gained by a single electron when it's accelerated through a potential difference of one volt, and the value for an electron volt is one point six zero times ten to the power of um, negative 19 joules. See, that is also extremely, extremely tiny. So, um, we're talking about very, very small things here. So that's just to keep that in mind so you understand when I'm talking about atomic mass and electron volts. So, um, when we, what we learned before is that protons and uh, neutrons have the same mass. We've, well, that's actually a lie. The mass does differ. So I've listed the masses here. Um, as, you can, as you can see, a proton and neutron have slightly different masses. But this is in the order of less than point around 0.1%, so it's very, very insignificant. That's why for previous equations, we've always assumed they have the same mass. But when talking about nuclear um, physics, we need very, very precise calculations. Um, there's, no, we're not, there's no experimental error when we're talking about atoms m more, um, combining. Um, atoms always, always um, are very, very regular, regular in their behavior. Completely predictable, so that's why we have this thing here. So let's go ahead and define um, how this energy gets created. Where does the energy come from? Does it just appear from the Well, of course not. 
basically what happens is I uh, like to use this analogy. Um, when a neutron and a, oh, sorry, when a neutron and a proton come together, um, they become more stable. They form a bond with each other, and this kind of holds together what we know as an atom. It's a whole bunch of subatomic particles. Now this bit here, when these bond together and make this tight kind of glue going on, there's this glue called the binding energy. And binding energy is actually a release of energy between this. The energy is actually released out of this and then that holds this together. And this confuses a lot of people. How can releasing energy hold something together? Don't we need energy to hold things together? Because we kind of have this idea of a man standing between um, two, holding up something falling off a cliff. So if we kind of have this idea of a man holding something falling off a cliff and that we need energy to hold things together. But this isn't true. I like to think about, if you've done chemistry, you'll know that when we talk about molecules that come together, say carbon monoxide, um, when this makes a bond like that, um, what you find is that um, this bond actually releases energy. It creates an exothermic reaction. This is the basis of petrol burning. This is the basis of all um, exothermic reactions. And basically, I like to think of this as a bridge. Since when you when these bond atoms come together, they form a bridge between each other. And to break that bridge, to break the atoms apart, we have to put energy in to break this bridge. So if we have to put energy in to break the bridge between them, we are giving them energy to return to this separate states. And when they come together, they have a lower energy state by being together because they become more stable. And the whole point of everything in the universe is it wants to get into the lowest energy state possible. So by coming together, they, they, they go into a lower energy state, and their energy is released as energy into the environment, as heat energy. So energy is released, and that kind of holds them together because they can't separate without giving the energy back in. And that's the glue which holds them together. That's what the binding energy is. It's the energy you need to put in to separate them again. So we know with um, carbon and oxygen, where they bind together, we're talking about chemical potential energies. So that that kind of change and re allow the change, release and gain of energy. When we talk about neutrons and protons, we're at such a level that you can't really talk about chemical potential energy anymore. It just doesn't make sense. So where does the energy come from, whether gain or lose? Well, this is back to E equals mc squared. Because these things are so small, when they gain or lose energy, they actually gain or lose mass. So when neutron and proton combine, there's a small section of each one which kind of just drops off, which disappears and just gets converted into pure energy. And then when they need to separate again, they need the energy back in. So we put the energy back in and these things actually gain mass. The neutron and proton together binded weighs less than the neutron and proton separately because to get it from this state to that state, we have to give it energy. And when it gives energy and we want to get the other way around, it releases energy and it changes its mass to release or give the energy that it needs. And this is how, I mean, think about it. If you want to bring two protons together, you'll essentially bring two positively charged things extremely, extremely close together and, and holding them there and making sure they stay. I mean, atoms don't just kind of disintegrate. Most atoms don't just disintegrate in front of us. They stay very, very stable. And this is the binding energy I'm talking about. This is energy that we release. And it's a lot of energy. If you think about it, the speed of light squared is a huge value, That's a, but we're not talking about this, um, say, 1 kg of carbon releases some energy. We're saying that the amount of mass lost equivalent to 1 kg releases so much energy. And this is what powers the stars and the universe. And it's a lot of energy, and this is kind of the energy of the future. It's more than, it's more than a thousand times as efficient as petrol. And we can run off anything. We can just we can merge hydrogen. That's like the most abundant um, element of the world. So that's why it's, we call it the future of energy. So how do we discover mass deficit? Well, it all came with measuring the helium atom. Well, I'm not sure which atom they measured, but we can see an example through the helium atom at least. So let's take a look here. So what we found, what do we think a theoretical mass of a helium atom would be? So we have here we have two neutrons. Um, a helium atom has two neutrons, sorry, two protons, as well as two neutrons. So let's give our calculations for that. Um, we're talking in ma atomic mass units here, not um, kgs. But I mean, um, so uh, theoretically, our neutron should equal uh, 4.031882 atomic mass units. Helium, sorry. 
But um, when we measured it, we actually found out its real mass is 4.001508 atomic mass units. And you can see there's a disparity between these. The actual atom weighs less than your theoretical calculations. And you can find this with every single atom. Because the, they need energy to hold it together, and therefore they have to have lost mass. And the mass they lost is called the mass defect. In this case, the mass defect is just the difference. 0.030374 atomic mass units. And if you times that by the speed of light squared, you get the, something called the, you get what the binding energy is. So the mass defect is simply the um, difference between, um, I'll give you definitions here. So but if you take this mass defect here, times it by the speed of light squared, um, also you've got to turn it back into joules. I'm sorry, turn it back into kgs. And also, um, we'll get the value in joules. We'll get the um, binding energy here. So, as of Cambridge likes, let's get some definitions going. The mass defect of a nucleus of a nucleus is, is the difference between the total mass of the separate nucleons and the combined mass of the nucleus. So here's the definition for um, binding energy. Binding energy per nu uh, is the energy equivalent of the mass defect of a nucleus. It is the energy required to separate to infinity all the nucleons in the nucleus. So if we have two a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons, to separate them, we need to give them back the mass they lost so they can become separate particles again. So we have to do this whole process in reverse. Now, I, so we need to talk about how we can make the most stable atom, because that's a goal, right? To make everything more stable. And you might be thinking, sure, we'll just add more particles on. The bigger the particle, the greater the mass effect. True, but we're not looking at the... Um, Things aren't considered as um, stable if they have the lowest total potential energy. It's the potential energy per particle. So I, if I'll have an example here. If we talk about a class where we have 6 people of 10 kg each, and um, we add on a person who's 5 kgs, what's that going to do? It's going to bring the average down. 4 kgs, 3 kgs, the average is going to keep dropping. Um, but what if we start having people which are uh, 11 kgs? Sorry, we're going to have some people having people which are... Uh, 8 kgs and 9 kgs, we're still losing mass from the main thing, but our average is going to go up. Our rate of change is going to go up. And um, that's really what mass defect is. Uh, that's the problem with mass defect. And it's probably best shown through a graph, in fact. So I'm going to draw a graph for you. Uh, so here we go. My graph. And on this side is the binding energy per nucleon, because we're looking at the Binding energy per nucleon. We're looking at the binding energy, the average binding energy for each particle. So if you take the binding energy is 100 joules, but there's 10 particles, so average one will be 10 joules per particle. And down at the bottom, we'll write um, a nucleon number. This is the bigger ones on the right. Um, so what we ha what we find is um, binding. So what we're finding here is um, there we will actually have a graph which looks something like this. So, um, and then the highest point here, uh, we are going to have iron four, uh, 56. And what you have to know is that, remember, the highest binding energy per nucleon means it, it's the item which is the hardest to separate, the atom that we need to give the most energy per particle to separate. So this is the most stable one. Um, well, you have to realize there's a difference between binding energy per nucleon and total binding energy. Total binding energy just looks something like, um, something like that. Sorry, something like that. Binding energy is always increasing, but we're looking at the binding energy for each particle to separate, per particle. So, um, iron is the most stable one, it takes the most energy to separate, and it's, um, therefore all atoms want to gravitate towards this iron 56. So what you'll find is particles on the right-hand side will try and undertake fission, which is where particles split apart and become smaller to try and get towards iron 56. And particles smaller than iron 56 will become bigger to try and reach this iron 56 level, and this is the most stable one. So um, nuclear fission happens to the right side, and nuclear fusion happens to the left side. And nuclear fus fusion on this side releases energy, and nuclear fission on this side releases energy. And I mean, if you keep adding particles onto this, you are going to keep releasing energy, but it's going to become a less stable particle, so that particles won't really want to add on. 
So that's basically um, how binding energy per nucleon relates to nuclear fusion and fission. Left means fusion, right means fission. And um, that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video.